Thank you, Cameron. Good morning, all. And um, I'll, I'll look at you for two hours, Cameron, if you feel Thank like you. Yeah, you need that. Yeah, uh, that love. And uh, I see we're pretty active on the chat bar this morning. Everyone's wishing each other uh, good morning and where they're from. The only thing that I ask, uh, my kids were really excited about today being March 1. And so the only thing I ask you do not put in a chat function is the uh, season three, episode one recap of The Mandalorian. Um, I'm still waiting to watch that with my kids. So. Uh, otherwise, chat away um, in the chat function. If you've got questions or just comments or any anything silly this morning you want to share with the group, feel free to do that. Um, just uh, by way of introduction, for those that do not know me, my name is Chris Bishop. I work with the law firm Walls Corman Kipner Bishop. I'm a shareholder there. I've been uh, practicing since 2002. Um, focused my uh, Workers' comp practice in Washington in 2007 and been just loving it ever since. Um, uh, by way of kind of just uh, introduction as well, um, I'm doing this on behalf of WSIA. It's a wonderful organization. If you're not a member of the WSIA, uh, I really highly encourage you join uh, the organization, uh, be active in the organization. There is a place for everyone within the organization, depending on your skill or desire to, to serve in different functions. We have a place or role for you. Um, so if you're not involved, we just encourage you to get involved. Um, I'd just like to just kind of promote them a little bit here today. Um, we are currently in a legislative session where we are battling a lot of uh, proposed bills um, from our colleagues on the other side that are trying to change the landscape of things. They, they, they've been up in the ante every legislative session in recent memory. So. Uh, Chris Deft is not with us today, and uh, he's battling on our behalf in the, the, the state house. And so uh, just uh, everyone send your best thoughts out to him. He's working really hard on our behalf. And if you have any desire to get involved in either the legislative process or the legal process, feel free to let us know. I oversee uh, the legal side of things on the WSA board and uh, would love to have people join my legal subcommittee to help uh, monitor the different uh, cases that are, are plowing through the board, uh, superior courts and court of appeals, Supreme Court. Um, part of my role is to, to kind of see what's going on, follow the trends and see if there's anything legislatively or policy wise that we need to kind of work on. So anyone interested in doing that, you know, feel free to reach out to me. You have my email here. Um, I'd love to, to put together a, a pretty strong legal subcommittee that works together and on some of these issues. So without much ado, let's begin with uh, the first case that we have here uh, this morning. Um, unless someone wants to prove me wrong, I, I couldn't really find anything that the Washington Supreme Court did that was spot on with the uh, Industrial Insurance Act or workers' compensation. Uh, but there was a pretty seminal case that came out uh, by the Washington Supreme Court this last year. Um, and then we'll turn to the next side, slide, and that's the Henderson v. Uh, Thompson case. Um, and if you haven't read this case, uh, I would highly recommend that you read this case. Um, the Washington Supreme Court came out and issued a number of statements that I think are highly relevant to how we uh, practice law, adjudicate claims, and just overall address uh, the different um, and diverse workers that, that we work with on a day in day out basis. Um, I, you'll see I put a lot of information on all my slides, which is not what I typically do, um, but I think there's a lot of quotes in a lot of the cases that we're reading today that some people may want to just cut and paste for future briefing or just future things that they wanna do. So I put a lot of language in my slides today so that you'll have it. Um, as we go over the Henderson v. Thompson case, I wanted to set the stage with the very first paragraph that the Supreme Court wrote, um, which I think was telling in how they were going to address this case. Um, they say, we owe a duty to increase access to justice, reduce and eradicate racism and prejudice, and continue to develop our legal system into one that serves the ends of justice. And then they go on for a number of pages in the beginning of their decision, talking about the history of racism and bias and prejudice that was contained within the legal system over the years. 
and how we as a legal community are um, trying to eradicate that from our system. Now, you would wonder, as I go through this case, why they started off that way, but I think they found the right facts in this case to make a point that they, they, they ultimately wanted to make sure all of us knew about, which is race, um, ethnicity, language. Um, none of that should play a role in the decision-making process. Um, within the courts, you know, I'd argue even in the department or the board. Um, and so as we go through this case this morning, I want you to think about, you know, how do they get to that point and how does this impact me and how I adjudicate claims and process claims and how can I avoid um, either explicit or implicit biases that I may have and how I uh, try cases or adjudicate cases to avoid this kind of outcome. So in this uh, case, Henderson v. Thompson involved a, again, this is not a workers' comp case, but I think it's very applicable to what we do. Um, it involved a, a plaintiff um, and a defendant. It was, a, it was a black woman who was involved in a motor vehicle accident with a white woman. And um, the plaintiff was asking for three plus million dollars in damages um, in, in the accident. And so throughout the process of the trial, um, the the plaintiff who was a black woman in this case presented you know here's how she was prior to the filing of this this motor vehicle accident claim um she was the life of the party according to her and her three witnesses all of who were uh, african-american and they had a very coordinated uh storyline as to what that meant the life of the party for her um, and then they all testified in conjunction very similarly that the motor vehicle accident drastically changed her life. Um, throughout the, the trial, there's a lot of uh, testimony that was taken from the plaintiff and her witnesses about the life of a party. Um, the defense counsel made a point uh, through cross-examination that when the plaintiff testified, she was very soft-spoken, she was very emotional, um, but when he cross-examined her, he characterized her in his closing arguments as being confrontational and combative. Um, he tried to, through cross-examination, paint her as someone who was greedy, who was seeking a windfall um, from this, what he characterized a, a, a very minor motor vehicle accident. Um, again, it focused on the amount of damages that she was seeking, over $3 million. Um, and ultimately, the defense counsel was able to convince the jury in this case that it was not a multi-million dollar um, verdict. It was more under $10,000. The damages just weren't that bad. Well, um, the plaintiff in this case filed a, what we call a CR 59, a motion for a new trial, alleging that uh, the defense counsel used race and other prejudicial tropes as a way to impeach the credibility of the plaintiff, who was a black woman in this case. Um, and the trial court denied that motion for a new trial. And so it ended up making its way through the appellate court process. Um, and specifically, as you see here in my slide, the trial court stated that attorneys are not required to refrain from using language um, if there are racial overtones. Um, Ultimately, the Supreme Court did not take kindly to that trial court's findings. Um, and they said uh, in this case that a trial court must hold a hearing on a new trial motion when the proponent makes a prima facie showing that the objective observer could view race as a factor in the verdict, regardless of whether intentional misconduct has been shown or the court believes there is another explanation. The party seeking to preserve the verdict bears the burden to prove that race was not a factor. If that burden is not met, the court must conclude that a substantial justice has not been done and order a new trial under CR 59. So in lay terms, what that means is if a party alleges that race or bias or prejudice played any role whatsoever in a decision, then it is the party who prevailed in the case that has the burden to establish that that was not the situation. And in this case, um, the defense counsel argued that they did not use racial tropes intentionally, that they, they, they were not um, making arguments in a way that would conjure up um, any racial issues or prejudicial issues. They were essentially 
just characterizing the witness as being combative or confrontational or seeking a windfall um, or exaggerating their symptoms, if you will. Um, why I think this case is instructive is because I see this happening in the workers' comp setting uh, quite frequently, where we characterize the injured worker as someone who's seeking more uh, benefits than they are owed, um, that they might be greedy, et cetera. Um, so why this case is instructive and why I would counsel everyone to read is because the way the defense counsel in this case um, cross-examined the witness, the way that they conducted their closing arguments, the Supreme Court found that a new trial um, may need to be considered based upon the factors that were presented in the case. Um, and so it went back to the trial court, and I'm not sure where it's at right now, but they had to uh, consider and go through the, the burden of showing that race was not involved. Um, part of this case, I think, is instructive for all of us. If you go to, and by the way, this, this was an opinion that it was called in bonk, which means all the Supreme Court signed off on it. But there are a couple um, concurring opinions in this case by way of clarification. And if you read the concurring opinion, they, want, they went out of their way to say the following. They said, that we do not read the majority's decision to undermine our precedent considering the importance of probing cross-examination designed to address witness credibility. Our adversary system requires courts to permit searching cross-examination of witnesses to test their perception, their recall, and their reliability. Um, and they also went on to say that they did not believe that the party is prevented from exploring a witness's financial or other interests that might undermine their credibility. Um, so they disagree to some extent with the characterization of racial bias in some of the defense counsel's arguments at uh, cross-examination and specifically said that the desire for financial windfall was not in and of itself a racial issue. Um, it was essentially just um, a characterization of what the, the injured party in this case was seeking. So um, a lot of back and forth between the Supreme Court um, as to what is and is not um, prejudicial or biased or racial as far as uh, cross-examination and closing arguments are concerned. Um, but I think we all have to just read this case and recognize the fine line that we are walking when we do go after the credibility of uh, an injured worker. Um, I think what this case is, is instructing us is uh, it's important that we focus on the facts, focus on the, the medical evidence, focus on um, other factors that are not necessarily personal in nature. Once we get into the personal attack of the witness, then we have to kind of watch ourselves as to whether we are asserting uh, biases um, or prejudices that could come out and impact the ultimate outcome of a case. Um, so by way of caution, and all of us who are attorneys, we have been uh, receiving um, different kind of training on these issues. It's just it's just very instructive on how we need to be careful in litigating cases so we do not come across as impacting the final decision in a way that could ultimately be overturned if we focus on a race or prejudicial or bias issues. Again, in this case, um, it does not come out overtly that the defense counsel was doing that intentionally. And the Supreme Court went out of their way to say it's still proper to cross-examine um, people uh, in a way that reaches, you know, their credibility and so forth. It's just the way you go about it. Um, you have to be careful. I think the other part of this case that's instructive and in why um, they may have focused on the, the bad acts, if you will, of the defense counsel that more than they normally would have, um, is that there was a discovery issue in this case. And for those of us who uh, do video surveillance quite frequently in how we uh, process and adjudicate claims, Again, I would highly recommend you read this case as it's instructive on how to handle our private investigations. In this case, um, the defense counsel called their investigator and the investigator testified um, about approximately 17 minutes of video surveillance of the plaintiff. Um, but throughout discovery, the plaintiff was seeking all of the investigator's video uh, messages, texts, emails, um, notes, uh, reports, those sort of things. In all video, whether it was good or bad, they were asking for it. And even the trial court was saying that they had to turn some of that information over. And 
over a year and a half went by in the discovery disputes about the, the investigation, uh, the surveillance, et cetera. And there's approximately 78 hours of video or time spent on this case, but the investigator only testified as to 17 hours. Um, so this case is very instructive. Uh, when you are doing uh, investigative efforts, uh, video surveillance, gathering information, intelligence, you have to be very cautious about the discovery process. If you turn over only the good stuff and refuse to provide the stuff that, that does not favor you, there could be uh, an instruction by the judge, um, what we call spoliation, which is um, if you don't turn over evidence that is bad, it's just going to be assumed that that evidence was bad because you're not showing it. Um, so it's, it's better to be forthcoming in the disclosure of your evidence. If you are going to be withholding evidence for a valid reason, make sure you're very clear about why you're withholding that evidence. Um, but the, at the end of the day, if you're hiding bad evidence and the judge um, or trier of fact comes to find out about it, it may not work in your favor um, and you may get sanctioned for it. So again, here's the Henderson v. Thompson case, instructive on uh, racial prejudicial issues as well as discovery. And I, I highly recommend this read, uh, even though it's not specifically workers comp, there's a lot of things within this case that apply to what we do on a, on a regular basis. So uh, with that, Carrie, if you could switch to the next slide. Okay. Um, so there is a case that was just granted by the Supreme Court. Um, if we go to the next slide, Carrie, um, this is the Long v. AutoZone case. This is a very interesting case um, because I'm not quite sure why the Supreme Court uh, granted review um, because the issues seem to be pretty clear cut at every level, the department level, the board level, superior court level, court of appeals level. Um, but the Supreme Court granted a review for some reason. And um, the attorneys in this case are, are trying to make a point. The thought, that point is as follows. Um, in this case, the Department of Labor and Industries was seeking an opinion from an independent medical evaluator, Dr. Bully. And there's a couple of issues that appears that were involved in this case. And one of those issues was whether the worker had a right knee um, patellar uh, arthritic condition that was related to the claim. And so they went back and forth, it looks like, with the IME doctor in this case to determine whether that condition uh, was or was not related uh, to the claim. Ultimately, they made the decision, the department did, to segregate that condition based upon the opinions that they got from the IME provider. Um, then the department um, turned around and asked Dr. Bully um, questions about work restrictions. Um, and there seemed to be some confusing responses and ultimately they tried to um, they tried to get a clarification from Dr. Bully as to what restrictions were applicable and whether they're claim related or not. So after the segregation order issued, Dr. Bully issued an addendum report. And the uh, claimant attorney in this case did not um, appeal or protest the original segregation order. Uh, and 72 days went by after the segregation order issued. And then they looked at the department file and they noticed that one of Dr. Bully's agenda reports was contained within the department file. And they made the argument that, hey, you know, department here's a report from an IME provider that would suggest that the segregated conditions are in fact uh, work-related. He's commenting on work restrictions and in those comments, he seems to suggest um, that the pre-existing arthritic conditions were work-related or that the work restrictions were caused by those conditions. Um, so they asserted that, okay, the department, there was a timely protest, even though we didn't bring this to your attention for 72 days after the segregation order that receipt of the IME report by the department after they requested the opinion constituted a protest. So um, the department did not buy that argument. Um, they said the IME doctor was not an agreed party. They were not uh, considered a healthcare provider within the meeting of RCW 51-52060. Um, and therefore, uh, the IME doctor's opinion would not constitute a protest um, like a, 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 an opinion from an attending provider who was actually treating the worker. 
Um, there's a bunch of motions that went back and forth on this issue and ultimately um, the claimant's side lost those motions for summary judgment, um, went to the Court of Appeals, they lost again. And again, the Supreme Court um, took this on, they granted review. And we anticipate a decision uh, sometime uh, this year. Um, the, the, the Court of Appeals decision, which is under review, said uh, specifically that while they try to characterize Dr. Bully's addendum on work restrictions as a protest, it was not. To constitute a protest, the communication must reasonably put the department on notice that the worker is taking issue with some department decision. In making this determination, we consider the content of the communication itself and the relevant information that was in the possession of the department at the time of the communication, citing the Boyd v. City of Olympia case. Um, the Court of Appeals concluded that Dr. Bully's didum on work restrictions did not constitute a protest. Um, the list of work restrictions in response to the department's request opined on work restrictions, not on the causation of those work restrictions. Um, so even if you were to assume that an IME provider was an agreed party or a healthcare provider, just looking at Dr. Bully's opinion in and of itself did not constitute what was causing those work restrictions. He was just responding to what work restrictions the worker had. Um, now, why is this case important? Why are we monitoring this case? Um, and what are, what are the sea changes that could happen? Well, if the Supreme Court comes out and finds that an independent medical evaluation opinion um, if it's adverse to an employer's position or adverse to a department order, if that opinion would constitute a healthcare provider's opinion, um, that would impact uh, cases uh, that are closed right now, uh, where an independent medical evaluator could have provided a den report that disagreed with the closing um, order or disagreed with the segregation order or something along those lines. As you all know, we have a, a duty to provide a protest to the department within five days of receipt. And so if the claimant's attorney prevails in this case that an IME report uh, could constitute a healthcare provider or a grief party um, ability to protest, then theoretically they can go back in time and mine um, IME addendum reports or even IME reports to determine whether this information contained in there that would constitute a protest to an adverse uh, department order against their interests. Um, so this could potentially open up Pandora's box is my fear. If the, if the Supreme Court grants ultimately the claimant attorney's uh, representation and an IME report and an IME provider can fall under that uh, umbrella of a grieved or healthcare provider that can protest, has staying to protest a department's decision. Um, so more to come on that one. Um, just as a reminder, uh, under, under that Boyd decision that is cited to here in Long Beach Auto Zone, um, claim adjudicators, it's important that you take a look at uh, chart notes, you take a look at documents that you receive from injured workers. And if a reasonable person would construe that document as a dispute or a protest to a department decision, please uh, forward that to the department within five days of receipt. Um, sometimes we just don't know. It's not very clear from the document as to whether they are trying to dispute or protest a decision. Um, and in those situations, I would just encourage you to pick other people's brain on how they would construe it. I know my clients sometimes will call me and say, hey, would you construe this as a protest? And we have that discussion. And sometimes we've even send a letter off to the department saying, hey, we don't construe this document as a protest, but we are providing it to you within five days as required in case you do uh, construe it as a protest because the test is also, if the department construes it as a protest, it's gonna be viewed as a protest. Um, and oftentimes the department says, we don't construe this as a protest, we're not gonna issue anything further. And but you've done your due diligence in that situation and don't have those uh, potential uh, landmines of things being left open forever if someone finds that dispute years down the road. Okay, um, so that ends our review of what's going on at the Washington Supreme Court. Um, so let's move forward to the next slides on what's going on at the Court of Appeals. So here's just a slide, kind of as a reminder, um, 
we have three divisions at the Court of Appeals. Uh, here's the geographical locations. Um, obviously, Division Three covers a lot of land. Um, not a lot of population there, but they cover a lot of land, and uh, they tend to be more conservative in our our, our experience. And then we have Division One and Division Two. Um, I haven't divided these up. I, I have put it in chronological order as we as they came down, but I just wanted you to see kind of how how the the world is divided in Washington as the Court of Appeals. So let's begin. The court appeals with the published decisions. These are decisions that carry more weight um, than unpublished decisions um, are most more significant. So although you can cite to unpublished decisions for policy or persuasive arguments, uh, published decisions carry precedent. Um, so let's start with uh, Smith v. Department of Labor and Industries. So this is, you'll see in our, in our uh, materials uh, this year, there's a lot of focus on uh, timely protests or scope of board review, um, people following or not following uh, procedures. And here's a situation where ultimately um, after uh, some warning, the claimant attorney was found not to have followed a, a very important procedure. Um, so in this case, the, uh, the claimant's attorney um, was attempting to represent the injured worker on a number of different claims. And you've all seen the letters that come through from the claimant attorney's offices. You know, we represent or we're not representing them yet, but we're asking for a claim file to see if we want to represent them. There's just various forms um, that we get from injured worker attorneys as to what they're doing and what process they're at in, in reviewing a claim. And in this case, the claimant's attorney sent a number of uh, correspondences to the Department of Labor and Industries regarding a couple of different claims. And in one of those, um, the attorney just sent a letter on their own, it looks like, saying they represent the injured worker, but there is nothing uh, from the injured worker themselves authorizing the injured worker, the injured worker attorney to uh, protest or to represent them on the claim. And so the, the department gets this letter saying, um, we represent so-and-so, we protest, but there's nothing there indicating the worker had authorized them to protest or represent them on that claim. Uh, the department actually called the injured worker attorney, it looks like one, if not two times informing them that, hey, you know, we don't have a proper representation, we don't have a proper protest, um, please get something into us indicating that the worker has authorized you to represent them in this case versus just you saying it on your, on your own. Um, and the statute is very clear uh, in this situation that the worker has to authorize the representative to uh, protest on their behalf if that's going to take place. So anyways, after the department advised the uh, injured worker attorney that, hey, we don't have a proper representation from you, so we can't view your information as a protest. He finally gets that 14 months later um, and then files a protest or a secured message saying he was protesting an adverse decision. Um, and so the department obviously denied that as untimely. Um, and the, in the process, they're looking at RCW 5104080. And I'll just read to you kind of the heart of this decision. It says the plain language of the statute makes clear that when a claimant desires to have a department order forwarded to the claimant's representative, the claimant must personally convey to the department a writing signed by the claimant that sets forth the representative's name and address. In other words, the attorney can't just do it on their own. They can't just say we're representing the worker and they don't have anything from the worker confirming that. The court then went on to say that the statute um, at each claimant's inception must have this requirement met. So it's not enough that you've done it on a prior claim if you're an injured worker attorney, you must do it on every claim. So here the claimant's attorney had it all properly wrapped up on a previous claim and he thought he had covered his bases and didn't have to do it again on the subsequent claim. But of course, as for every claim that you're representing an injured worker under, you need to have their written authorization. And in interpreting RCW 5104080, it says statute provides a means by which the claimant must request that an order be forwarded to the claimant's representative. The statute provides that an order may be forwarded to the claimant in care of representative before an order has been entered if the claimant sets forth in writing 
the name and address of the representative to whom the claimant desires this information to be forwarded. Um, so this is very specific to the statute. Um, it's very specific to the representation of an injured worker. Um, I have not seen the statute be um, construed in such a way that defense counsel must have written um, authorization from their clients to file protests and nor has the department ever interpreted it that way. So I'm not saying that it has to be construed to apply to defense counsel, but here's, here's a, a tip for you. And, and oftentimes we see this, right? You, you get a number of claims um, from a worker and a number of different letters from the worker's representatives. So my first tip is look at each one of those letters. Uh, make sure that the worker has signed off on each one of those claims that the law firm or the attorney is representing them on that particular claim. If they have not signed off, the worker that is, on the attorney representing on that claim, then that attorney does not represent them under that claim for purposes of the statute. Um, similarly, I see a lot of situations where the injured worker law firm withdraws representation and as they do so, they file a generic protest with the Department of Labor and Industry saying, hey, we're not involved in this scenario anymore. We're not you know, taking more money from our, our client. But just in case there's something out there, we're filing a protest. Um, I have got mixed results in this, but I usually respond to that uh, generic protest and say they don't have the authority to do that because they are no longer representing the worker. I think the department has historically construe those protests as valid protests. But this case would suggest, um, although it doesn't, it's not spot on with that issue, would suggest that if there is a withdrawal of representation, then that injured worker uh, representative no longer has the authority to represent that worker. And therefore, if they do one of those generic protests, I would argue, um, and I think I would encourage others to argue the same, that they can't, that, that protest is untimely. And unless the worker themselves files a protest after that withdrawal, then the order should go final and binding. That's an argument that I'm pursuing, and hopefully we can we can get some some case law on that because I think those are bogus protests. Um, all right, so that ends uh, Smith v. Department of Labor and Industries. And um, while we're at this point, um, I'll just pause, take a breath. And Cameron, do we have any questions in the chat or any good jokes that we can share, or should we move on? Uh, certainly no good jokes. Um, I, so far, the chat has been kind of quiet, but so people fire away. Um, All I right. will uh, feed those to Chris as we go, but let's continue on. Okay, thank you. I need a drink of water anyway. So, Okay, so the next published decision, Court of Appeals, this is Department of Labor and Industries v. Higgins. Um, this is a very interesting uh, over seven aggravation case. Um, in this case, the claimant sought to reopen the claim for medical time loss and or a pension. Um, however, the, the director of the department uh, used their discretion to only reopen it for medical and an increased PPD award. They did not um, utilize their discretion to give the worker either time loss or a pension. Um, the worker then appealed to the board to request the time loss and pension benefits. And so the question in this case was, what is the standard of review um, at the board on a post uh, seven aggravation claim? There's been a lot of debate and discussion on this particular topic. And I think the board has even given us inconsistent results on this. Um, and interesting in this case, um, the worker argued that the standard of review um, that the judge should use in determining whether they're entitled to time loss or pension benefits was a preponderance of evidence standard, which is a normal um, a standard review for you know, claim closure or other time loss irrigation orders. Um, and the, the argument in this case was that was the same standard here, even though it was a post seven uh, decision. Um, so the board actually said, yes, we'll use the preponderance of evidence standard. Um, and then the department and the others said, no, 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 no. This is an abuse of discretion standard. If you read RCW 51-32-160, it's pretty clear um, that the director is authorizing their discretion in providing benefits. And here I, I quote uh, the statute specifically, where it says it allows adjustments of benefits when a worker's disability uh, aggravates. Um, the director may 
readjust certain benefits, right? The director may provide medical benefits. Um, and so in looking at the statutes, the court of appeals in this published decision made it very clear that the standard review is the abuse of discretion standard. They said here the director exercised the discretion and refused to grant time loss compensation. Because the director has discretion to order or deny categories of benefits for closed claims, the Superior Court's ruling that such decisions should have been re reviewed for an abuse of discretion was not erroneous, which means the board's uh, preponderance of evidence standard was erroneous. Now, um, so in short, what this means is if you if you have a post seven aggravation case, you have to prove that the director abused their discretion um, in issuing the benefit that was issued. However, um, there's a, a little nuance here that if the, the question at the board is the amount of the benefit, then the likelihood of review is preponderance of evidence. So for example, the director, if they issue a, a increased permanent partial disability award in this case, the issuance of that award, the review of what the director should or should not have done that would be abuse of discretion. Now, if you get to the board, and there's a discussion as to whether the PPD awards should be a category two or a category three or a category four, the lumbar spine, for example, then the preponderance of evidence would determine the amount of the benefit. So the, the review for the director's decision is an abuse of discretion, but whether the benefit amount is correct or not, that still remains a preponderance of evidence. So that's a little nuanced uh, for us attorneys, but just for those out there not attorneys, it's important to note that it's very difficult to say that the director abused their discretion, but if the amount of benefits provided is that issue, argue that the preponderance of evidence indicates the amount should have been different, if that makes sense. Okay. Next, let's talk about um, Cordova, the Department of Retirement Systems. I don't know um, how many of us, um, are involved in cases like this. This was a very interesting case that's not necessarily starting off specifically as a workers' comp case, but because it um, implicates the workers' compensation statutes and analysis um, of what is an industrial injury or not took place in this case. Uh, this is a, it's actually a very sad case. It's a situation where a Seattle Police Department detective um, was assigned to uh, be over a team investigating a, a multiple shooting uh, incident of three other officers. And this detective who was assigned to oversee the investigation of this um, did so for a period of time of approximately 10 days. Um, obviously very highly uh, stressful situation, a lot of trauma involved with the officers that were shot um, in this uh, injured worker. Um, had never done something like this in a supervisory fashion before. Um, after about 10 days being assigned to investigating this incident, um, the worker's wife um, left him uh, and his son. They're upstairs, looks like, playing on iPad or watching TV. She went to go to an errand. When she came back from her errand, she unfortunately found her husband um, had passed away with his iPad on his chest. Um, and so the... Uh, surviving spouse here filed an application with the retirement systems, the law enforcement officers and firefighters program, LEOFF, if you're not familiar with that. Um, and under that program, they have a statute that says that the special death benefits will be provided. And this is RCW 4126048. If the death was a result of injury sustained in the course of employment, or as a result of an occupational disease. Um, in this case, they did not litigate the, the cause of death uh, being occupational disease. They litigated it as an industrial injury. It was determined that the cause of death was a um, form of stroke. Um, it was pretty sudden. And so the argument that was being made by Mark Raggi, the claimant's attorney in this case, was that this stroke event satisfied the uh, definition of an industrial injury because during this 10 day period of time, there was a lot of stress involved in dealing with this traumatic event. And ultimately that stress over that 10 day period of time 
um, they argued, caused the stroke. Um, in this case, however, the court said no. And they looked at the definition of industrial injury under RCW 5108-100. It said that the testimony demonstrated that there was no evidence that a single identifiable event during the 10-day period, uh, period issue can be characterized as an unusual exertion within the ambit of a sudden intangible happening of a traumatic nature uh, required to establish industrial injury. And these cases that we're, we're, we're looking at that involve strokes um, or things of vascular nature, um, you have to demonstrate that there was an unusual exertion. And that could be a physical exertion or an emotional exertion. And this case goes over the precedent of different physical emotional exertions that have existed in the past that were compensable or not. Um, and in this case, they found that although there was a lot of workplace stress uh, throughout that 10 day period of time, that there was no qualifying event or one specific thing that happened that would constitute an unusual emotional or physical exertion to have caused that stroke or one specific, uh, specific event that they could point to. Um, you know, again, the wife's testimony, which she saw her husband watching TV on the iPad with her son and returned and uh, he was deceased. There was no indication that there was some sort of immediate emotional response to something that he was doing at work when that occurred uh, or that he was exerting himself physically to the point that would have caused a stroke during that period of time uh, between when she saw him both before and after um, his death. And so take a look at this case. There's a lot of good language in here as to what constitutes an industrial injury. Um, you know, they specifically say an injury cannot be based on multiple exposures or multiple traumas occurring over a period of time. There must be a clear identifiable event that can be defined, a specific event. Um, and again, in, in vascular accidents or strokes, you've got to show there's a certain emotional or physical exertion that would have occurred prior to the event, in this case, the death. And so um, in this case, ultimately, the worker was unable to prove that. Okay. So let's move on to Longhorse, the Department of Labor and Industries. Hey, Chris, this, I've got a question for you. Um, came in right. on the Q&A. Uh, I thought I'd break it up. Uh, it's from our, fat, our friend Patrick. Uh, he asked, for later, if a worker declines to sign both the PIR and the SIF2, is the claim allowable? And this was right after your the uh, prior presentation, right when I said there were no questions, it popped through. So, and then you started going. Okay, I've written that down. Um, I will, I'll pause here to just generically answer this. I can't give out specific legal advice in a, a legal seminar, um, but here's what I can, I can offer you in response to that. Um, typically the department's gonna require uh, physicians incident report or providers an incident report um, to allow a claim. Obviously, there's case law out there that that document in and of itself is completed and signed and says there is a claim that that is prima facie evidence of an injury or occupational disease. Uh, we know recently this, this year, there's been a lot of song and dance between us and the, the Department of Labor and Industries as to uh, the SIF2 foreign issues. Um, and at the end of the day, the department has said there's seven essential function or essential parts of that SIF2 that must be completed by either the worker or um, the claim manager uh, overseeing that claim. So if, uh, I guess at the end of the day, if you know about an industrial injury or an occupational disease has been brought to your attention, the department has instructed or encouraged us to complete the seven essential portions of the SIF2 form and turn it into them uh, for the commencement of a claim. Now, the question is whether that just automatically allows the claim, I would say no. Um, you still have to look at medical evidence and um, the circumstances giving rise to that claim. But um, the department has kind of taken a proactive position. I think uh, they're gonna be enforcing this throughout uh, 2023, that if we knew about a claim, it was brought to our attention, and we, we try to get the worker to sign SIF2, 
and they just didn't return it to us or for one reason or the other, they were unable to return it to us. They are taking the position that if we know about it, we should complete the SIF to form uh, at least the seven parts of that that they deem to be essential and turn it in and with the recommendation as to whether it should be allowed or denied or whether you need to request interlocutory status to figure that out. Thank you. So Karen, did I get to the heart of that question? I hope. I, I think so. Um, very good question. And, and it's uh, definitely one of those policy issues that have been uh, going back and forth. And I know some people have you know, litigated that or try to litigate that, but that I'm just kind of giving you the department's perspective on that because I know what they are trying to enforce and how we can be penalized. So my goal is not to have anyone penalized today. <laughs> um, okay. So uh, let's go on to the next slide around the long course case. This is, um, this is an issue that has been percolating ever since I've been practicing Washington workers comp. And the, the primary person that would always bring it up in, in cases with me was uh, Jerry Casey, uh, who's now since retired. Um, but I, he was the main proponent that I saw was pushing for this, although others were pushing for it as well. And essentially the facts are these, right? So uh, someone files an aggravation claim. Uh, we all know that uh, there's 90 days to, to have a decision on that to avoid becoming deemed granted. Um, and that we should make that, that decision within 90 days as best we can. If we, we cannot make that decision within 90 days, you know, we try to request a 60 day extension to allow us to get additional information such as independent medical evaluation or gathering prior records or taking even claim statement for that matter or getting a completed uh, document of some sort. Um, so in this case, um, the department actually denied the claim initially within 65 days, but then the worker requested uh, reconsideration of that denial. And um, time went on, you know, we all know the department has, has, has some issues doing some things um, sometimes on a timely basis. But for one reason or the other, after the request for reconsideration was filed, um, the department ultimately affirmed the denial 184 days later. So obviously uh, the worker was not very excited about the delay that it took in reaching that decision and filed an appeal to the board um, where they lost and uh, Superior Court where they lost and then ultimately to the court of appeals where they lost again. And their argument was that, look, you know, the worker has to have a remedy. Um, and this should have been a deemed granted situation because so much time elapsed between when they filed a protest to claim denial and when the department uh, actually affirmed claim denial. And in their opinion, you know, there should have been at least a, if, if not 90 days or 150 days, there should have been some period of time, but they're arguing primarily 150 days by which the department should have made a decision. Otherwise, this would have been deemed granted and the claim should, would have been uh, reopened. And here's, um, here's just another front that we may be fighting um, in the next legislative session, if not in this one, um, if there's some last minute things that happen. But the court said this, uh, and looking at and interpreting um, RCW 51 uh, it does not contain any language that provides that reconsiderations of uh, petitions in any circumstances you know, would fall within this, this argument. Well, they say both parties here recognize as we do that there's no time limit for the department to rule on a petition for reconsideration and no remedy for exceeding such a time limit. This is a problem for the legislature to remedy, not for the courts to remedy. Um, and then they go on to say that, you know, the workers said, well, we're left with no other remedy other than to file a writ of mandamus or asking the superior court to make the department act. And again, the court of appeals just said, well, that is a remedy you can seek, but ultimately we're not gonna read into the statute something that doesn't exist. If you wanna fix this situation, go to the legislature and fix it. Um, so those of us in our, WSIA legislative gang that uh, look at you know issues and things to anticipate coming down the road. Um, I anticipate that given multiple statements by the Court of Appeals 
and uh, just kind of how the facts in this case played out being you know, 184 days after the protest, the department finally acted on the protest. It just it creates a, a, a fact pattern that doesn't look great in front of the legislative body when they're trying to figure out what the remedy is going to be. So look for potential uh, legislative remedies on this issue in the coming years. Um, it's been an issue that's been brewing for some time now. And now that we have this decision that's published, I anticipate that we'll probably see some, some legislative proposals um, like we've seen in the past. All right, did I see uh, some action? I saw some things popping up on my screen camera. Was there some, some comments or anything on that one that I need to be aware of? I was actually able to take care of it, so. Okay. We're good, we're good. keep going. Good, good, yeah, I'm glad, I'm glad I have you there troubleshooting all that stuff. Okay, uh, let's move on to the next Polish case, the Barreto Garcia um, versus the milk growers. Um, this is a, this, this case just came down in December of last year. And um, if my recollections, let me just double check. Uh, on January 31, 2023, the Court of Appeals granted it a published uh, status, which means it carries presidential value. Um, and so this case um, is going to be significant on how we litigate fixity in closure of certain claims uh, going forward. Um, so pay attention to this one. Um, this is just kind of just a, a brief fact scenario for you. Um, this is a, a situation where an injured worker had a crush kind of um, injury to their chest, um, had some pulmonary issues resulting therefrom, moved to Mexico, ultimately uh, was seeking treatment in Mexico um, perpetually under the claim. And um, then there was action taken by the employer to try to move this claim towards closure because effectively all that the worker was receiving treatment wise was uh, medication for his pulmonary uh, condition. Um, the department initially agreed with the department of the employer's position. Uh, they closed the claim and the worker uh, appealed that and the board at the IAJ level and the, 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 the petition for review level all affirmed closure. And the argument in this case was, was the ongoing receipt of medication for this worker's pulmonary condition, would that constitute um, under WAC 296201002 sub three, uh, like a state of um, taking them out of fixed and stable and making them more in the state of uh, receiving treatment that would be considered cured. Um, traditionally, you know, when you look at claims and you, you look at workers who are taking medications perpetually for one reason or the other, you can make the argument that the use of that medication is palliative in nature, meaning there's not going to be any fundamental or marked change in accepted condition by the use of the medication, and therefore the department should close the claim. Uh, recently, the board has issued decisions where they have specifically said that if the PPD award takes into consideration the need for ongoing use of medications, then that would constitute a situation where you can close the claim, even when the medication, uh, the, the determination that medication could impact them uh, in a fundamental marked way. Well, here, um, ultimately the worker prevailed um, and the Court of Appeals looked at other decisions um, that were similar in nature. And so they were not convinced by those decisions. And there's a lot of dispute between um, the judges on this case. Um, the majority said that according to the WAC, a worker's condition is not fixed and stable if a fundamental or marked change in an accepted condition can be expected with or without treatment. In this case, the worker um, said that they would experience pulmonary edema, a condition that would require hospitalization and therefore a fundamental or marked change uh, could happen if the workers ceased taking medication. And they went on to say that the clinical effect of terminating um, the medication would increase the, the pulmonary edema causing you know, excess fluid in the lungs. And therefore uh, the use of the medication was actually curative because the stoppage of the medication would have such a fundamental or marked change for the worker. Um, why I say this is a, um, 
pretty significant case that we need to watch is because in this case, there's citation to other situations um, where if someone is um, on opiate medication and the stoppage of that medication uh, renders quote unquote disastrous results, then that could fall into this kind of scenario. There's other um, references in this case to the, a need for ongoing psychotherapy for depression um, being curative uh, because the stoppage of that psychotherapy could lead to um, suicidal ideation uh, or other detrimental impacts on the worker. Um, so I'm not sure to what extent this case is gonna be stretched even more um, in the coming uh, days and, and months, but it's just something to keep an eye out for um, but here's, um, here's just a couple of uh, tips or pointers that I would recommend for you if you're faced with this situation. First, if you are in a situation where a worker is on uh, a medication, get an opinion from the medical provider at the outset that, that medication is palliative in nature, that the stoppage of that medication would not uh, fundamentally uh, change the worker's condition. Um, if you're in litigation, um, Get your doctors who are proposing the perpetual use of medication because there is going to be a fundamental change or mark change if it's stopped. Get to admit that they're speculating. Um, it's very hard to predict what the stoppage of medication would or would not be as, as far as some conditions. This case, ultimately, the doctor felt it would cause uh, a pulmonary issue. But in the other cases, it's speculation as to what is, is or is not going to happen because we just don't know. Um, unless there's a history of the worker stopping the medication and having poor results because of it, we really it's very difficult to predict what will happen in the future if they do stop medication. Um, and finally, again, I would just um, look to those board cases where they say if the PPD award, if you look at the AMA guides or the category ratings, if it references that it takes into consideration the need for lifetime medication, there's some vascular conditions out there that do say that. Then you can argue that that's already been taken, in, that benefits already been taken into account and a claim should close because the PPD award takes into account and pays for that medication. Um, there is a dissent in this, and I just kind of want to read this because I think we should be citing this if we, if we get faced with this issue uh, in the future. Uh, the dissent is said essentially that the majority rewrote our, our WAC um, 296-20-01002, um, which says when no fundamental mark change in accepted condition can be expected with or without treatment. They said that the, the majority wrote that or and inserted an and, 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 and that that was improper. So they said under the majority's reason, the condition must be fixed and stable with treatment and without treatment, which is a rereading of that rule. So I think, the dissent allows us to argue um, the, the loophole here and that this does not fix the, this, this law is still kind of being discussed. And so uh, we still argue it's left to us. Uh, one final just, uh, just tip, if you're, if you're uh, having this discussion, just please note that WAC 296-20-01002 does use the word can in it versus um, shall or whatever, but that word can was interpreted by this court as all you have to show is it's possible the medication could have an adverse effect. Um, so where you're in litigation, you're gonna have to, to play with that can word, that possibility word a little bit to, to get the doctors to say they can't say on a more probable than not basis it's possible. So uh, there's the- hey, Chris, I got a question. Please read that one. Yep. Uh, would this apply to, uh like someone that needs uh, catheters for the rest of their life with this same uh, methodology? So I, I think I, um, I mean, obviously facts matter. Um, and, you know, depends on your situation. You know, catheters could be viewed as durable medical equipment. And there is a rule specifically addressing durable medical equipment. Um, you know, if you have the wrong doctor saying the wrong thing, theoretically, it could apply. But I would argue that um, if someone needs catheters for life, that would fall under the durable medical equipment uh, rule versus uh, this. Um, but, you know, it, as this case proves, anything's possible. 
but I would argue that that, that would not be fall into this case. Okay. Good question. Okay. Thanks, Chris. And we're about at the halfway point, just uh, for your own pace. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, let's see. If we could turn to the next slide there. So now we're moving into the realm of uh, unpublished cases at the Court of Appeals. These are cases, again, that don't carry as much of a precedential value as far as when you cite them, whether further courts will obey and follow the direction of, of the appellate court. But certainly uh, these unpublished decisions give us um, an idea of where the, the trends are, what uh, policies are trying to be implemented in future litigation. and so. Um, obviously, there's going to be some, some information contained within these cases that we'll want to monitor and, and see. Um, the IME case I cited to earlier, um, that was an unpublished decision and the Supreme Court granted review. So these cases could ultimately have an impact on our lives one way or the other. So let's start with the first one. Uh, Collins v. the Department of Labor and Industries. Um, this is a case where the, the worker argued um, that the board didn't have a certain scope of review. So in this case, the department issued an order segregating a certain condition from the claim. And then later, it looks like they rejected the claim after the segregation uh, order issued. And the, the worker tried to argue, first and foremost, that the department did not have jurisdiction to issue even a segregation order um, but ultimately, they were trying to argue that the department couldn't issue a rejection order after they issued a segregation order. Um, they also tried to get, and this is why I included this case, and I thought this was interesting. Um, the worker also tried to get the claim manager to testify in the case. Um, so we'll talk about that. Um, ultimately, the, the Court of Appeals said in this case that uh, no legal authority that prohibits the department from adjudicating claim with a separate claim from the same claim. In has been appealed. Um, the, in fact, they, they reiterate that the department has original and exclusive uh, jurisdiction over all claims, which we'll talk about uh, down the road in another case. Um, and then they go on to say that uh, the worker in this case bore the burden of proof and that to prevail on appeal, you must establish a prima facie case that the cervical disc degeneration uh, was not work-related. And you must do this by medical evidence, which we all know. But here in this case was interesting. He tried to bring in uh, the claim manager to argue his case, effectively saying, well, the claim manager uh, knew that there was medical records out there that would support claim allowance. Um, and therefore I want the claim manager to testify. Um, so if you're ever faced with this situation, um, here's some language uh, you, can, you can cite. The, the, the court of appeals said we conclude Collins was not entitled to have his claim manager testify because such testimony would not help him establish his prima facie case. And in this case, he was trying to prove the causation of his cervical disc condition. Um, the Superior Court found that the board did not err when he determined the claim manager's testimony was not relevant to whether Collins could establish his prima facie case. And they go on to say uh, what the su substantial evidence standard is. So if you're ever faced with a subpoena as a claim manager, claim adjuster, um, and uh, you're trying to get out of it uh, because you're simply just processing claims. You don't have a medical opinion. Uh, this case does allow you to say that your te testimony would not be relevant on the prima facie issue of, as to causation. So that should hopefully make your rest a little bit easier at night that they can't come after you like they sometimes do. Um, just kind of as a tip, Oftentimes the department issues a lot of orders. Sometimes they make sense in the order that they issue them. Sometimes they don't make sense in the order or fashion that they issue them. But what this case tells us is, and I've seen this before, uh, the department can, before they make an allowance or, or rejection decision, they can make a decision on a specific condition. In this case, they segregate a condition. I've seen cases where they've allowed a condition before they've allowed a claim. But ultimately the department has that jurisdiction to do that. And that they ultimately have the ability to uh, issue an allowance rejection order after they issue such an order. Um, so take a look at that. Uh, that those arguments generally don't carry much weight um, at the court of appeals. But again, 
uh, kudos to the claim manager in that case for escaping cross-examination. Uh, Chris, we got another question. Not on, okay. not on this case, but it's on the, the prior one. It seems like that, that was a bit of a hot topic. Here's the question. Um, Hi, Chris. Is this medication needed for life? Referring to the cardiac case we just described two cases ago. If so, does this mean that this claim would need to stay open for life? That is ultimately um, what that case would suggest could happen. Um, and we have uh, tried to litigate that issue um, multiple times. I've seen the department take different positions on that but you're referring to the Beretta Garcia case. So um, what that case suggests is until that medication is no longer needed to prevent the pulmonary edema from worsening for that injured worker, the claim will have to stay open. Um, that in that case, the employer is going to have to try to find evidence that at some point in time, that medication is no longer quote unquote curative in that if the worker stops it, um, he won't have a fundamental or marked change in his pulmonary condition. Um, but otherwise, and unfortunately for that employer, um, they're going to have to be keeping that claim open for a little bit longer. Perfect. Thank you. And that's why that's such, in my mind, a seminal case, because we all see it. Um, I've, I see it a lot with mental health cases. I've got a handful of those in my office that I've seen right now um, where uh, where they, they argue that without the ongoing um, psychotherapy that the worker's condition is going to deteriorate significantly, um, which also kind of seems to fly in the face of the department's requirements to pass that if someone does have a mental health condition, they have to undergo intensive um, therapy for the first 90 days to get to that curative point. Um, but um, there are cases out there where people are receiving psychotherapy for a significant period of time in that case, cites those situations as um, analogous to the medication. So it will have more of a, not just an impact on just on the medication cases, but other kind of therapies as well. Again, I'm not sure about catheters, case by case, right? So um, good questions, though, I like it. Uh, okay, are we on uh, Sierra uh, Pacific? For the next slide, please. Um, just to, I'll spend just a few minutes on this case. This is just a case for those of uh, you who are lawyers or out there or those who like to follow uh, legal tactics uh, to kind of pay attention to. In this um, case, Sierra Pacific Industries, we have our good friend, Dr. Lang, that was um, providing inconsistent testimony uh, throughout the proceeding on an aggravation case. And uh, the defense attorney in this case took the discovery deposition of Dr. Lang and elicited a number of statements from Dr. Lang that seemed to uh, suggest that Dr. Lang was not supporting uh, an objective worsening of the condition at issue um, and was kind of uh, be, being wishy-washy at the best, right? Couldn't, couldn't really say it one way or the other or said that, that the defense position made sense to some degree to him. Well, um, Ultimately, Dr. Lang was called to testify on behalf of the worker and did what he normally does and, and supports the worker um, and explained, you know, looking at electrodiagnostic testing and other things, uh, why he thought there was an objective worsening. Um, then the department, uh, then the defense counsel uh, pulled out the discovery deposition of Dr. Lang and tried to impeach his testimony and got Dr. Lane to admit that he uh, said certain things in his discovery deposition that were inconsistent with his uh, hearing testimony. Um, ultimately, uh, the, the department denied the claim. It looks like the board overturned that, and the Superior Court uh, overturned the department as well, and the Court of Appeals ultimately uh, affirmed reopening of this claim. And you'll see in this language that I put out here uh, why they did that. They, the, the Court of Appeals essentially said it wasn't enough to say that the doctor provided inconsistent statements in a discovery deposition. They said that Dr. Lang, in this case, provided additional testimony explaining why there was objective worsening, why the claim should be reopened, and that to point out on cross-examination of, cross of inconsistent statements was just not enough 
to render Dr. Lang's opinion um, incredible. And so what the court appeal said is you have to do a little bit more that this point out inconsistent statements on cross-examination doesn't get you over the hump on, on overturning the board's decision. You're gonna have to do a little bit more and really dig into, in this case, Dr. Lang's opinion to get him to say he's essentially reversing his opinion or he said this at the discovery deposition and that is his opinion at this time on a more problematic basis. Um, you gotta go look for on cross-examination. You gotta pin him down really hard and with Dr. Lang, I appreciate that that's not an easy task because he is slippery. Um, but in this case, just having a, a good discovery deposition and impeaching them on cross-examination is not enough to overturn a board decision. Um, so um, my, my, my tip here is that if you do have a good discovery deposition, you get that doctor pinned down and you know he's giving you good opinions. Um, Get a, get a good motion for summary judgment drafted. Um, don't wait until you go to the hearing and, and get the testimony that the worker's asking. Get that motion for summary judgment drafted. Have that debate before you go to hearing and see how it flushes out if your discovery deposition is, is, is good. Um, okay, next one, Blanchard, the uh, Washington State Employment Security Department. Um, This is a pretty straightforward case. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on it, but it's interesting um, that this worker in this case um, actually received a pension and then was uh, before the pandemic, uh, maintained his pension while he was working 30 hours a week. Um, and so for one reason or another, that, that working 30 hours a week didn't undo his pension. In the pandemic, uh, hit and his number of hours worked um, per week uh, became less to non-existent. Um, and so because of that, he uh, filed for unemployment benefits and um, sought benefits. So again, um, he's receiving a pension. I think that case said about $5,000 a month. Um, and so as you may know, when you file for unemployment benefits, you have to uh, affirm that you can uh, and you are able to look and work uh, for work. Um, so I'm not sure exactly what he wrote, but that's typically what I see. Um, and the, the court just came out and said, you can't get both. You know, you can't get unemployment benefits if you're receiving permanent total disability benefits, which is the right thing here. Um, my tip though is, let's say you have an individual who is receiving a pension and uh, they do apply for unemployment benefits and you're not uh, wanting to pay that pension anymore, get a copy of those unemployment records. There's a minefield of stuff in those things the workers have to complete and affirm under the penalty of perjury that they can't work, that they're looking for work, that they have no disabilities preventing them from working. There's a lot of questions along those lines. So if you have a worker who's applying for unemployment benefits and is receiving time loss or even pension benefits, get those records. There might be something in there that could allow you to make the argument that they should no longer be receiving temporary permanent total disability benefits. So anyways, the straightforward case, can't double dip, but uh, it just uh, goes to show that uh, there's some, some ways you can you can find uh, to end those pension or, or time loss benefits if you look for it. Okay, uh, CAR versus Department of Labor and Industries. There's a number of cases in, that came out this last year um, that talk about notices of appeal, scope of appeal. Um, this is just an interesting case. Um, I kudos to the, the defense attorneys in this case um, who were able to, to make this argument. But essentially, this is a case where the claims attorney um, filed a notice of appeal and in the notice of appeal asserted um, only one causation theory as to what caused, um, in this case, I think it was a knee condition. Um, and then throughout the, the litigation process, it seems to me that the theory of the case was transforming from one cause to another cause. Um, but at no point in time on the record did the claimant's attorney uh, modify the issue or modify their notice of appeal to address the alternative cause of the knee condition. And ultimately, um, the, the judge and the board affirmed rejection 
of this of this uh, claim. Um, so then they go up to uh, Superior Court, and the uh, claimant's attorney argues that hey, I have this alternative theory as to what caused this knee condition, and uh, it never got addressed at the board. And so we need to take a look at this alternative theory. And uh, the Superior Court and Ultimate Court of Appeals um, said, no, 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 you, we're not gonna, we're not gonna listen to your alternative theory. Your notice of appeal did not include that. You didn't put anything on the record of this alternative theory. And therefore the record was concluded at the time of, of the hearing. So uh, this is just a word for wise that if you are filing notices of appeal to make sure your notices of appeal cover all theories of your case, all issues of your appeal, um, it doesn't have to be too specific, but it should be broad and generic enough to cover all issues. If throughout the process and litigation, you see that the issues or the, the theory of the case is changing in a way that was not clearly identified in your notice of appeal, you should take uh, efforts, at least at the scheduling conference, to put that issue uh, into the records so you're giving notice to opposing party. If uh, during a position or hearing, new theories, alternative causes get brought up by doctors, um, please make your record immediately that you're amending your issue um, to include that alternative cause. Um, Absent doing that, you'll find yourself in a situation that like this claims to train what I think they wanted to um, make that record and they said they did, but they ultimately could not cite to uh, the record demonstrating that they were changing their issues as the theory of the case progressed. Um, so that is just a word for wise. You never wanna to get to superior court and argue for the first time um, that the cause of a condition is a certain cause that was never addressed or, or spotlighted while you're at the, the board or hearing level. Okay. Let's move on to Aldridge um, versus the Department of Labor and Industries. I put this in there. It's, it's a fun case. It's a case that came down about a year ago. Um, it's an interesting case because, because it talks about the fairness doctrine. You'll, you'll see a lot about fairness. Um, being addressed in the court proceedings that we're dealing with nowadays. As I started off in that very first case, there is a movement in the legal community to make sure things are done in a way that's completely fair to all parties. Um, and in this case, um, and in, in cases that we are all seeing right now, we're seeing a lot of uh, workers who are litigating cases um, without representation and the board and other tribunals are doing a lot of things to make sure that they are treating the unrepresented worker in a fair way. Um, and we'll see another case that kind of applies there. But in this case, it's, it's interesting. Um, Ms. Aldridge had a, she was representing herself, but her husband had a prior worker's compensation case. And in that prior worker's compensation case, um, there was an issue as to whether her husband uh, when he testified with the board needed security um, for her, her husband being there when he testified. So that was the husband's case. Um, then the wife files her own appeal before the board. And she was essentially arguing that because of the way her husband was treated, and these are is an African American couple, because the way her husband was treated, because the board requested security for her husband, that she was not being treated fairly herself in her case because of her husband's uh, security issue in his case. Um, she ultimately was trying to prove that the board was biased against her and her family. And she was trying to bootstrap her husband's experience into her appellate experience. And um, the, the came out and said this, which I think is important for us to, to read. It says, the appearance of fairness doctrine assures that proceedings before administrative tribunals are fair and impartial. That is, that is the key component to these cases. Under the doctrine, uh, proceedings are valid if a reasonable, prudent, and disinterested observer would conclude that all parties obtained a fair, impartial, and mutual hearing. The party challenging a proceeding must provide evidence of actual or potential bias. It's not enough to just assert it, you have to provide evidence of it. The party cannot satisfy their burden by merely speculating about potential bias. We presume that the public officers properly and lawfully perform their duties. Um, this kind of is a war story side note. 
I faced this uh, situation myself recently uh, when a pro se worker uh, accused the hearing judge of being drunk during the proceedings. I never had that accusation made at any point in time in any proceeding up until this year or last year. And so the board actually went above and beyond the call of duty. And, and even though there was no basis for that allegation that the board judge was intoxicated or otherwise uh, uh, under the influence of any substance, the board did engage in a very serious uh, investigation of those allegations and ultimately proved um, that the workers' allegations were incorrect. So we are seeing a lot of interesting things at the board. Um, pro se's are causing um, the board to take this mandate very serious um, about fairness and sometimes the delays. Uh, I know clients wonder why are we at the board for so long on pro se uh, litigants, and it's, this is the reason why. The board is trying to make sure that they're complying with this doctrine. Um, and that sometimes requires multiple hearings, delays, continuances to, to afford the worker who's unrepresented um, uh, the ability to put on a case in a fair and an impartial manner. Um, and we'll see some of that in some of the cases that we next. Okay. We move on to uh, the Corral v. Glacier Northwest case. Um, this is a case that came down last couple of months. Um, and it's a case that uh, the fact pattern would seem very similar to, to multiple um, situations that we all face. The worker files a claim, worker gets released back to modified or light duty. Worker probably is not the best worker to begin with, but we're trying to accommodate um, their work restrictions. Um, on light duty, the worker was assigned to uh, run errands from uh, one job site to the other job site, east to the west job site throughout the day. And there was a particular route that was generally expected for the worker to take. It's a shorter route between those two job sites. Um, and one day after the worker returned back to modified duty, she decided to take a longer route between those two job sites and um, go to a uh, grocery store and do some personal shopping with some bulk groceries. And it just so happened that uh, the employer was aware of this and found her shopping um, in route between one job site to the other. She had her work vehicle at the time she was doing this. Um, and uh, there's a bunch of other factors at play. Um, it seems like the next day or two that the worker was brought in. Uh, she was cited chapter and verse in the, the employment or handbook policies of not using uh, vehicles for personal gain and other uh, employment policies that were violated because of this action. And the worker's uh, job was terminated at that time for violating company policies. And the worker's time loss was also terminated um, based upon uh, board precedent. Um, and so the worker obviously was not very happy with this outcome and was trying to challenge the NRA Chad Thomas decision and other decisions about terminating time loss benefits um, after uh, employment discipline when you runs on modified duty. And ultimately, because of the facts that were in place in this case, the, the employer prevailed um, in the end. Um, and I would just say in reading this case, the employer did a very good job of documenting um, the worker's duties on modified uh, in her modified position where she was supposed to be at um, one location versus the other. They did a very good job documenting the best route between those two job sites. They documented that the route she took was essentially a deviation from the best route. They did a very good job documenting that she was engaging in personal uh, shopping while working and using the work vehicles, etc. Um, that she did not communicate what she was doing at this time. And overall, they did a good job citing in the termination um, package all the employment policies that were violated by this worker um, for purposes of terminating her employment, which led to the termination of her time loss. Um, so if you're faced with the situation, I would highly encourage you read this decision, see what the employer did here, which is really good. Because um, at the end of the day, um, all their documentation was cited by the Court of Appeals. And they said they did what they were supposed to do. They followed their policies. They did not treat this worker any differently 
than they would have treated any other worker violating these policies. And so that is the key in these situations is that when you have employment policies that you implement them across the board, whether it's an injured worker or a non-injured worker, so-and-so modified duty, so-and-so on full duty release. Um, if it's seen in any way whatsoever that you're targeting um, a disabled or injured worker and that you have policies in place but never implement them, then um, an outcome could be different for you. But in this case, the employer was, did a very good job of documenting why the termination put, took place and why the employment policies were important to them um, as well as other workers. All right, let's move on to the next one. Um, so you'll see in this case, another court of appeals cases, um, a lot of timeliness issues. Um, the, the law requires that when you um, are trying to appeal from the board to superior court, that you file your, your appeal with superior court and that you copy and serve on all parties that um, appeal, that filing. Um, and a lot of issues have arisen over the years on this, on this topic. Um, and you'll see uh, this last year was not an exception. So in this case, um, the worker was uh, filing. I think the worker in this case was pro se. They filed um, their appeal to superior court. Uh, there's some debate as to when they ultimately received the board's petition for review, whether it was May 11th or May 24th, but ultimately that didn't really matter. Um, they, they filed their notice of appeal, what it looked like to be timely, on June 18th, but they did not serve uh, the employer and the board until June 28th, which is over 30 days, and they did not serve the department uh, until July one of that year. Um, so ultimately the court said we hold pro se litigants to the same standards as attorneys as to compliance with applicable court rules. We also interpret our rules liberally to promote justice and facilitate the decision of cases on the merits. This is a rule of appellate procedure 1.2 that our um, board judges are very familiar with now and cite uh, when we talk about this fairness doctrine. Notwithstanding um, interpreting rules liberally to promote justice and, and to promote fairness, non-compliant with statutory mandates or deadlines does not constitute substantial compliance. Um, and therefore the hard deadline of 30 days had to be met regardless whether they were pro se or not. And so um, the reason why I wanted to highlight this case is oftentimes I'm seeing at the board where Pro se litigants are given kind of a little bit of a leash, if you will, uh, when it comes to complying with deadlines, complying with certain procedures. And I think this is a good case uh, to cite, and there's case law within this case to cite that would say that you know, they are held to the same standards as uh, licensed attorneys or others. And that if there is a statutory mandate of a deadline, that they don't get more of a leash or leeway than anyone else. Um, so uh, there you go with that one. It's pretty straightforward. Okay. This is a case that um, Carlos Serrato v. Esterline Tax uh, is a case that's going to drive people nuts in, to some degree, but um, you'll see you'll see why it's in here. So, in this case, the worker. Uh, file a claim for an industrial injury. You know, normally you have one year to do that. Um, the worker in this case filed their claim for industrial injury after one year. And uh, it appears that there's silence on that uh, filing, that untimely filing. And nonetheless, the department, despite it being untimely, allowed the claim. Uh, some time uh, went by, approximately three years went by. Um, before a protest to claim allowance was filed, um, the department said, oh, well, mea culpa, uh, we will reverse claim allowance. This was untimely um, and they rejected the claim. And ultimately the worker appealed, the board actually affirmed for the rejection. Um, and then the worker continued to appeal and won at the appellate level. Um, the employer was trying to argue that the department had no jurisdiction to allow the claim initially because it was untimely. But here's what the court said. 
timely filing is necessary for a claim to be allowable, not for it to be adjudicated. The department has subject matter jurisdiction to make the decision on benefits for uh, Calasaro's workers' compensation claim. The department lacked authority to award benefits on an untimely claim, but it retained subject matter jurisdiction to determine timeliness. Its determination the claim was allowable was an error of law that Esteline could have successfully challenged by timely protesting order, but failed to do so. Um, so in other words, uh, the department has the ability to look at these things. They have uh, jurisdiction to determine whether a claim is allowable or not, timely or not. If they issue an order, even if it's an error of law, if that order goes final and binding, um, you're kind of out of luck. So if you look at a situation that you're not quite sure if it's timely, you're not quite sure the, the, the department issued an order within their authority, protest it. Don't wait three years. Um, if you failed to protest it, uh, regardless of whether the, the department's decision was an error uh, or not, because they have jurisdiction to make the decision, as this court goes, um, if you fail to protest, that decision will become final and binding. Um, so my, my, my big ask for you is if you look at if you look at it, and you're not quite sure. You have that gut feeling that maybe this just does not seem right. That the department did something that they shouldn't have done. Uh, preserve your protest. You know, you can file just a generic protest saying, "Hey, we're taking a look at this. We're not quite sure if this is timely or not. We want to put this on hold. Do that within 60 days. If you wait three years, you're not going to be able to unring that bell of claim allowance." So, there's the moral of that story. We are at 30 minutes, Chris. So it's the home stretch. All right. How are, we, how are we doing? Everyone's still awake out there? And, uh, I think so. Zoom land, I hope. Okay. Okay. I'll, uh, we got a few more to cover here, and I'll do my best to get through them all. But uh, here we go. Let's talk about uh, Dixon v. Department of Labor and Industries. Um, this is very similar to one that we just uh, went over. This is, again, proper service of an appeal to Superior Court. Um, in this case, the notice of appeal was delivered to the board, but not to the department. The, um, the worker said that, you know, they put the, the department on effective notice of their appeal um, by sending it to the board. The department ultimately got it. So they had effective notice. Um, but here the Court of Appeals said, no, it's not enough that you serve the board. Um, you also have to serve all other parties. Um, RCW 5152-1110 requires an appeal be perfected by mailing it to the department and the board. Um, so just uh, again, a lot of, lot of uh, issues occur with service in the last couple of years. Make sure you're reading the statutes, complying with the statutes and perfecting your appeals um, because they're not giving much by way of leeway. Again, they say non-compliance with an appeal procedure does not constitute substantial compliance, no matter how inadvertent non-compliance may be. Um, so perfect it. Um, if you uh, find yourself in this situation and uh, don't know how you got there, uh, try to find a way to argue that the party that said they did not get notice actually got notice or that you performed the service in a way that was reasonably calculated to give them notice. That's kind of your only out here. Um, so, okay, let's talk about the next one, which is similar to this, the Fred Meyer case. Um, in this case, very similar. Um, claimant, is, claimant is represented in this case. The claimant uh, attorney actually uh, filed with Superior Court uh, at the time of filing, the claim attorney said that they mailed all the, the documents to the other parties. The other parties um, said they did not get the documents that supposedly were mailed to them. Uh, claimant's attorney and his office signed a bunch of declarations about how they filed the, the documents, how they mailed the documents, their process for filing, the process for mailing the recollection of putting the documents in the mail. Um, and uh, essentially they argued, we did everything we had to do. We're blaming the United States Postal Service here, guys. Uh, it's not our fault they don't function properly. Um, so uh, in this case, the, the Court of Appeals uh, uh, dismissed Fred Meyer's challenge to the perfection of, of the uh, filing. 
is that a party um, that shows an office customer with respect to mailing and compliance with the customer with specific instances um, is enough to show evidence that they perfected the filing and the service. And mere evidence of non-receipt cannot be used as a basis to deny the worker the opportunity to have his appeal heard. So just because you don't get it, um, if the other side provides declarations and they swear up and down that we mailed it, we mailed it, we mailed it, the court's not gonna deny the worker their appeal um, if they can show that they follow their established practices. Um, I disagree with that, um, but um, if that's what the court says. I think if you find yourself in a situation, a good thing because you know there have been mailing issues, um, you know, find ways to better serve. Um, you can do a certified mail, get agreement to uh, have the other parties received by fax or email. But make sure you, when you file, that you have some sort of receipt that you can point to that you mailed it um, and the other side agreed to that form of receipt. That will save you a lot of headaches. So, okay. Um, next case, Simpson v. Department of Labor and Industries. Um, believe it or not, we are still litigating parking lot cases. Um, this parking lot case actually went all the way to the Court of Appeals. And I think this is kind of a significant parking lot case because the Court of Appeals, um, in this case, kind of poo poos some of the board precedent. Um, just kind of real quickly, the facts of this case are um, the worker had an employee parking area and she would park in that parking area and go from that parking area to the front of the, um, I think this was a hospital. And in the front of that hospital, there was an, another parking area for patients and then a loading and offloading zone for those patients to go from that parking area into the front doors. So in this case, the worker parked in the employee parking area, walked uh, to the front doors, and as she was in the um, parking area for visitors, slipped and fell and injured um, herself. And so there's a bunch of arguments that were being um, made by the worker in this case as to why her parking lot case uh, should be allowed. Um, first of all, she argued that uh, the parking area where she parked in was a visitor parking area. Um, there's some loading and offloading that went on there. So it was kind of a mixed use parking area. And so that essentially that was not a parking area under the statute. Um, she also argued that just by showing up to work and parking in the employee parking lot, she was in the course of employment as she walked from there to the front doors. Um, and uh, she also argued that, you know, the employer in this case was kind of controlling where the employees should park versus where they shouldn't park. Um, and so you'll see here my bullet point two, it says, <clears throat> this of course said, the employers routinely exercise supervisor control over parking areas, designating where employees may or may not park and even assign individual parking spots. The board's reasoning in the Kerry case, uh, which said there's a difference in parking lots, um, renders the parking area exception virtually meaningless. This we refuse to do. In other words, this court is saying, we're not gonna recognize this differences between employee parking versus other parking and employers controlling certain parking areas versus other parking areas. The statute says parking area is an exception. That's all it says. Um, and they say here, there were multiple routes into long-term care building for multiple employer-owned parking areas, as well as street parking. The hazard that caused Ms. Simpson's injury was shared by the general public because it occurred in the public visitor parking area. For these reasons, the hazardous route rule does not apply, which is a separate exception to the parking area. Um, so the key to this case is that the worker um, wasn't going down a stairwell, wasn't on a sidewalk, uh, wasn't, didn't fall in the actual loading area, um, and she actually fell in a visitor parking area. So all those keys in this case, facts matter in parking lot cases, allowed for the employer um, to succeed in this parking lot case. But I like this case because it says, we're not gonna make it, we're not gonna go through the sign and dance the board did and carry and determine what kind of parking area is or is not controlled or assigned. A parking area is a parking area. So if you follow a parking area, absent some other reason being the furtherance of your employer's interests, it's, a, it's, it's not a, an allowed claim. Okay, 
Let's talk about Montgomery. Um, just real quick, uh, this is a, again another uh, timeliness case. In this case, uh, the claimant's attorney had to file a petition for review to the board. Um, it just so happened that in March of 2020, the COVID pandemic was declared an emergency and things and everything was being closed down and shut down and we were all quarantined and, and in our homes, not leaving and doing things uh, that were not normal to us. Um, so in this case, unfortunately, the claimant's attorney um, had a deadline to file a petition review in March of 2020. And um, he knew of the deadline, but he told his legal assistant um, when he completed his petition review uh, the week before, he gave her the wrong date to file the petition for review. And his legal assistant, who was not in the office uh, regularly at that time because of the COVID um, pandemic, uh, didn't have the opportunity to check her calendar to see if the date he gave her was the right date. It was actually two days later than the date it was supposed to be. In this case, the date was March 24. He gave her March 26 as the following day. So he missed his deadline. And so he filed a CR 60 motion for relief um, and effectively said, yes, I did give my legal assistant the wrong date, but my legal assistant was fearful of uh, being uh, of contracting COVID and therefore was not able to go in the office like she wanted to and therefore was not able to really verify the, the actual deadline. Um, so here, um, the board um, did not give him the relief. The Superior Court did not give him relief and neither did the Court of Appeals. Um, they ultimately concluded that the claims attorney was unable to cite to any irregularity at the board level. Um, and I found this a little bit, um, for those of you who've been following things, this quote I found a little bit funny. While Montgomery contends that COVID-19 was affecting the board when she filed the petition, she does not demonstrate that the pandemic created irregularities and procedures before the board. Nothing in the record indicates that COVID-19 impacted the board's procedures or processing of case, Montgomery's case. So um, we know that there have been irregularities at the board, but in this case, uh, the claimant's attorney was not able to prove those impacting them. And the moral of the story is don't throw your legal system under the bus, except if you're following your story, if you're trying to miss your deadlines, um, we're ultimately responsible for knowing and meeting our deadlines. And uh, it wouldn't be fair to, to say that your legal assistant um, is responsible. So just a second. For me, Karen, my earbuds just died for some reason. Sound, sound okay. Okay, sorry about that. I had them fully charged and I guess I was just talking too much. Maybe just put them away here and... 15 minutes, you're almost at the finish line. <laughs> all right, but you can still hear me all right? Yeah, sound fine. Perfect, okay. Um, let's spend some time on this case. I don't know if I'll get to the, the tentative board stiffing cases today, but I want to spend some time on the Varney v. City of Tacoma case. So um, just uh, by uh, give you some uh, context or a preamble to this case, I hope everyone has been following um, the updates that Chris Taft has been getting from uh, on the weekly basis or sometimes more than once a week um, as to what is occurring in the legislature right now with legislation that would penalize um, employers, et cetera, for bad faith claim processing actions. There'd be additional penalty um, added to decisions that would be effectively found to be made in bad faith. Um, if you're not following that, pull up your emails from Chris, follow that. There's two pieces of legislation that he is fighting pretty hard right now in the legislative session um, to, to prevent us from getting more penalties um, in additional settings. Um, to kind of summarize, this case involves the city of Tacoma. And so if anyone's involved in this wants to chime in, um, let me know. Um, I'm certainly not involved in this. But um, it's not a workers' compensation case per se, it's a tort case. Um, and in this case, 
um, our good buddy Ron Myers filed a tort claim against the city of Tacoma. And in that tort claim, again, this is outside of the workers' compensation setting, he alleged abuse of process, tortious conduct, outrage, discrimination, and a hostile work, work environment. And in the tortious conduct um, complaint, uh, he discussed negligent claims handling um, by the city and negligent and or intentional infliction of emotional distress um, by the city or the representatives, et cetera. Um, in this tort case, um, Varney's attorney, Mr. Myers, is um, asking for a number of documents to prove that the claim decisions that were made um, were made in a bad faith. Um, or as he also uh, tries to argue that uh, there's fraud or some sort, sort of fraud that's going on in the processing of this claim. And in order to prove his claim, he submitted a number of discovery requests, it looks like, to uh, the city to try to get at um, his argument. And it looks like the city produced over 19,000 pages of documents pertaining to the workers' compensation claim. Um, some of these documents that they were looking for included communications between the city and their attorney, uh, the city and industrial insurance coordinators, the city and their TPA, um, et cetera. So think of all the communications that you enter into with your TPA, with your attorney, with the department, they're seeking all of those documents in this tort case, again, outside of workers' comp. Um, a lot of these documents were redacted um, by uh, the city and the discovery, and that began a discovery uh, dispute between the parties. Ultimately, the trial uh, court appointed a special master for discovery given the amount of documents, the disputes involved in the um, nature of the arguments that were being um, made by Mr. Meyer and his office. Um, at the end of the day, there were the parties um, sought the Court of Appeals um, opinion on three, or excuse me, four, it appears four different discovery issues. Um, and one of those issues that the Court of Appeals ultimately said they would act on was the fourth issue. Um, and that issue is whether there was a partial or blanket waiver of attorney-client work product privilege um, applying under the fraud exception in the context of tortious abuse of process allegations in the case. In other words, he's trying to argue that a privilege uh, or work, a trade client privilege or work product privilege did not apply. And therefore the documents could not be redacted because he was asserting a tortious fraud exception to those privilege. And he was using um, a case, the CEDL or CEDL, C-E-D-E-L-L case, the State Farm case that says when there is bad faith or fraud proven in the processing of claims, then you can't hide under um, a privilege to, um, to say the documents cannot be provided under the fraud exception, bad faith fraud exception. So at the end of the day, uh, he's trying to get out everything, every document that we consider privileged in workers' comp. Um, and fortunately in this case, the Court of Appeals uh, did some exercises that I thought were helpful in differentiating between um, the workers' compensation system and a typical uh, private insurance system where you have a contract for insurance between the insured and um, insurer. In those cases where there's an insured and insurer, there's a fiduciary relationship um, and the Insurance Guarantee Associ Association Act applies for bad faith fraud cases. Um, that sort of uh, contract does not exist between um, the worker and their employer in uh, workers' compensation cases. So ultimately, the Court of Appeals came out and said, um, they sent it back to the Superior Court and said that this bad faith argument um, on getting at this privilege, piercing the bell of privilege is not gonna apply to this workers' compensation case. Um, 
so that is a that is a that's a good win for that that uh, for the city in that case. That case appears not to be over. Uh, appears to be percolating still at Superior Court, and uh, other issues may come up in the future. But what I wanted to do is highlight why that case is important in light of this legislation that's pending. Um, the legislation that's pending that we're going to be still talking about trying to tweak a little bit if we can, uh, could potentially create a situation where a bad faith claim could exist in tort against employers and their TPAs and potentially even representatives of those individuals. Um, if the legislation passes, it could create a duty uh, of, of good faith in processing workers' compensation claims and further to comply with that duty could create a tortious action or at least the filing of a tortious action uh, and the piercing of uh, the veil for product that's privileged or attorney client uh, records that are privileged. So watch this carefully. Uh, if you have connections in the legislature, uh, please let Chris Teff know. Um, this legislation is poorly drafted. Uh, the implications of this are, are, are bigger than, than most people realize, I think. Um, and it's in our best interest to make sure if the legislation passes that there are limits uh, put on it because ultimately um, this legislation could impact this, this superior court case that the city that Calm is defending. So uh, Cameron, did you see any reaction to that? that we need to discuss? Uh, nothing yet. Okay. So I'm gonna uh, skip through a couple of cases here. <clears throat> I only have a few minutes left. So I'm gonna skip to the uh, Pedro, Enri Pedro Sia case. Let me go a couple of slides. Um, so just for everyone out there, the, the board has not put forth any uh, official significant decisions for 2020. There is a handful of tentative uh, significant decisions uh, that they put out there and some they just put out there um, for the October time period. And so I've tried to do my best to highlight all the tentative significant decisions that are out there or are pending. Um, but most typically if it's designated a, tentative significant decision, it generally becomes a significant decision. Um, so I wanted to um, just jump to this Pedro Silla case um, because there is um, some debate between the board members on this particular issue. And I, I thought I'd highlight this because I, I'm seeing this debate ongoing at the board. So in this case, the uh, claim was allowed for just an industrial injury. It was not allowed for an occupational disease. Um, and so when they got to the board, the worker tried to argue that the denied condition of right knee osteoarthritis was due to the distinctive conditions of the worker's employment versus due to the specific industrial injury. The board struggled with this one because um, sometimes in the past, the board kind of broadened the scope of their review to say if a claim's allowed, then you, know, you can bring up other, other, other issues for a claim allowance. Uh, but in this case, the board came out and they actually overturned prior case law that they had. And they said, where a claim has been allowed for an industrial injury, the board does not have jurisdiction to entertain um, on a future segregation order, a future claim closure order, uh, or any similar time loss order, you name it, that they cannot entertain an occupational disease theory for why time loss is needed, for why permanent partial disability would be different, or for why the claim, uh, claimant needs more treatment. Um, if the claim is allowed for, time uh, for an industrial injury, then any theory before them has to be related to the industrial injury itself. It can't be related to an occupational disease theory. Um, with that said, um, the board said, obviously, the worker, you know, I think in the past, sometimes board judges would say, hey, for purposes of um, expediency and moving things along, we'll address an occupational disease theory and an industrial injury allowed claim, but they're putting their foot down saying we're not going to do that. Um, 
Why I think this debate is still alive is you'll see that um, there's a dissent from Isabel Cole where she says the following. Um, Throughout the history of the act, the rules have been adjusted to ensure the promise of swift and certain relief is met. Bold print has become required in all determinative orders to alert the claimants that failure to appeal that order will result in that order becoming final. This works well when the specific benefit being allowed or denied is spelled out in the order. But in the case of allowance orders, there's nothing in the wording that explains the granting of one benefit means the loss of another by failure to appeal the order. So in essence, what Isabel's saying is, you know, typically the department and self-insured claims don't allow a claim for a specific condition or for a specific reason. And therefore it's unfair to the worker to not allow them to pursue an occupational disease theory on an allowed industrial injury. So I think this debate may be ongoing. Um, who knows where uh, uh, we'll end up at. I know in another case that uh, Isabel Cole did a dissent and she continued to cite the seizure case. Um, so she's not done uh, addressing that. Okay, let's uh, move on to uh, Mountie real quick. Um, quick moral story on, on, on the Kerry Mountie case. case. Claim closes, uh, the worker wants additional time loss from the time that the claim, uh, the time loss was terminated until claim closure. It's about a, a two month period of time. The employer says, well, <clears throat> if you're gonna ask for future time loss, then we're gonna file a cross appeal and ask for time loss going back to 2017 um, because the medical evidence that we're looking at um, demonstrates that the worker was, as it relates to claim-related conditions, was capable of working, yet time loss was still um, being paid and ongoing until it was terminated in 2019. Um, So they filed a cross appeal. Uh, There was no overpayment requested. Uh, there was no dispute of the back time loss um, as it was being paid. Um, the theory was, well, if the worker can request additional time loss going forward, all issues are before the board, so you can go back and request prior time loss. But the board said this, <clears throat> where a self-insured employer has reason to believe an overpayment has been made, it must make a petition for repayment within one year of making any such compensation. After such a request, the department will then act by issuing an order, either assessing an overpayment or not. In the case of an overpayment assessment, the worker is entitled to contest that order as provided by the statutes. The attempt to cross appeal skirts the statutory obligations surrounding overpayment assessments. So the moral of the story is, um, although there was some uh, creative lawyering, you know, when you get the file, you look at it and you see, hey, maybe we should have not paid time loss. Um, it, the board is not going to take away benefits from a worker unless it was disputed. Um, so if you're paying time loss, you have a question about it. You have opinions in your claim file that the worker um, is able to work for the claim related conditions. Um, if, if you're going to pay ongoing time loss, dispute the time you, you pay it. And then um, at some point in time, a claim closure requests the overpayment because the board is not going to allow a cross appeal to be successful if you have not disputed the time loss and or requested uh, an overpayment at the time of closure. Um, so that. Uh, that, that case uh, came about before the, the templates were really in place. Um, and uh, the hearing judge tried to cite the template rules as a basis for his opinion. But the board came out and said, yeah, those template rules are in place now. They weren't in place then, so you can't cite to that. But so effectively, <clears throat> the board's saying use those templates to dispute. Um, they're not inclined to take benefits away from workers if a dispute was not created prior to uh, the appeal. Okay, I see I'm at my limit. The, uh, the next two quick cases you can look at, um, you know, the McClinton case essentially says you can't submit video as part of the board record. Um, and uh, that's just an interesting case because claimants attorneys in surveillance cases want, their, want the board to record them on Zoom so they can have that in contrast to the video surveillance where the board said, we will only have video surveillance in the record regardless of how long that is, but we will not have Hearing testimony is part of the record because it's too long and too much to consider. Uh, That's my Cliff Notes cynical version of that. So uh, with that said, uh, Cameron, any last minute wrap up things that we need to cover? Yeah, there is one last question that Kelly shot in. Uh, She says this, hi, Chris, do you think we could ask for the the overpayment order at the same time 
as the cross appeal asking for the backdated time loss term date? Yeah, I think what the board is instructing us here to do is um, you should request that overpayment order at the time of claim closure um, and dispute that at that time. If you do at the time of the cross appeal, um, it's going to be too, the cross appeal will be premature. Okay. Um, which is which is why um, it didn't work out in that situation because there was no overpayment. We have so much time to file a cross appeal, and so we, we tested that one out, and that's what they instructed us to do. So get that overpayment in at the time of claim closure if there is one, but dispute even if you are paying time loss to do on a disputed basis if you think you're going to try to collect that back at a later time. Okay, I do have one more question, and anybody who needs to drop off, I totally understand, but it, since it came in. Uh, what if the injured worker is terminated on date of injury for cause violating safety policies? Are they eligible for time loss? Um, well, there's a lot of lawyer to question depends. Um, <laughs> uh, were they taken off work um, by the doctor? Uh, would be one question I would ask if they're if if they've been taken off work um, by the doctor. There's a lot of facts involved there. Um, I typically in that situation, <clears throat> what I would what I'd recommend be done is you um, get a letter from the doctor saying that they could have done that job and you would have offered them that position, but for the termination, that is a better way of going about it um, to cover cover yourself. Um, that would be my thought and recommendation there. But again, it just depends on the facts. If, if they get injured and, um, and uh, they're, they're not taken off work, then obviously I don't think it would matter. But um, yeah, but I, I guess just um, if you're an employer and that happens, you got you to really question yourself. What do you have the basis to terminate them? Is, if, is it for a safety violation, for example, um, they violate a drug policy or something that just make sure you're following your policies and that if someone else has done that in the past, that they also got the same treatment. Um, but um, the facts matter, um, but it depends, I guess is a quick question for you. Excellent answer. Well, Chris, I'd like to thank you uh, on behalf of Wisha for uh, talking for two hours. That is quite a workout. You did a great job. Voice sounds like it's in good order. Um, as I put in the chat, to everybody, but in case you didn't notice it, uh, Carrie is gonna put the PowerPoint uh, presentation along with a certificate of attendance on an email later this afternoon to everybody who joined. I think at one point and early on, I saw 97 people on board. So that, that was, that's a really good number. Uh, just appreciate every everyone attending and uh, hope to see everybody at the annual conference. Absolutely, and thank you Cameron for this and Carrie for helping out. Again, contact Chris if you can help out on any of his legislative efforts. Good luck, everyone out yes. there. Absolutely. Everyone have a good day. Take care. Bye. Bye-bye.